Action Network International. So um, the group actually first formed about 27 years ago with the purpose of bringing international development and environment groups together, recognizing the interaction between poverty and environment issues um, to learn from each other and to advocate uh, with one voice. So the climate change negotiations are one of those spaces where the group has been most active over these last 27 years. And it's one of the clearest examples of where development and environmental issues are really closely intertwined um, and where we're working together to fight for climate justice. Um, there's other important spaces that we work on as well, including G7 this year, uh, consultations on the UK's international development strategy, um, work around how odour and climate finances allocated and spent um, and much, much more. Um, but last year, one of the things um, we did as a group was to write a flagship paper uh, called the Triple Emergency. So really encapsulating this issue and some of the, the solutions that are needed. Um, and that paper is on the, the Bond website. So I do, uh, do encourage you to, to take a look at that if you're interested in this theme. So all around the world, we are dependent on nature for the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the water we drink, and the climate that makes our planet habitable. Uh, yet we're facing global climate and ecological emergencies, and they're exacerbating deeply rooted structural social injustices, poverty, and inequality. So what we really need to see is a global just transition to the sustainable, inclusive, and resilient future that's been envisaged in the Paris Agreement and in the SDGs. And this is the decade really where we've got to get that done. The science is very clear on that. Um, this is the decade that we have to collectively limit climate change, restore nature and create more fair and equal societies. And that's why some of the um, summits this year have been so important. Uh, the interaction between climate change people and nature shows the need to understand and address this unprecedented triple emergency in an integrated way. Um, and again, in the paper that I've already <laughs> plugged, there's a, a useful diagram kind of showing how some of those interactions um, work. Um, and consideration of those interactions is really vital to the solutions because we now have the challenge of um, achieving social justice, gender equality, human well-being for all, but in the context of permanently altered natural planetary systems, including the climate system um, and the la and landscape scale ecosystems. So we also have to, alongside that, limit warming of the climate system to 1.5 degrees to prevent the extreme human suffering um, that that would cause and also the catastrophic loss of nature and also alongside that, we need to halt and reverse the biodiversity loss and nature's decline, because without that, we actually can't achieve uh, the other elements as well. We can't limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. We can't prevent mass um, extinctions and we can't achieve social justice and, and human well-being for all. So what that all means is that development is fundamentally changed. Business as usual, as, as we've kind of understood it, is a thing of the past. Development now exists in the context of global decarboniz decarbonisation within the next 30 years and escalating climate impacts. So it really does change the entire context of, of, of what we're doing and, and how we need to go about doing that. Um, so that's real, there's a real call to action for government, governments, businesses and civil society to work together this year and through this vital decade of action to recognise and support the interdependency of people, nature and climate. And um, we laid out in the paper kind of three kind of priorities for, for doing that. The first is around increasing ambition under these different conventions and, and, and tools that we have. So raising ambition across the SDGs, in the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP15 um, that was also um, was meant to happen last year, was delayed, was kind of formally opened, but talks will conclude next year, as well as the COP26 in Glasgow in November. So we need to use all those spaces um, and all those conventions to, um, to increase ambition. Um, and we know that current actions under those conventions aren't yet matching what the science or what justice demands. 
Um, but we know what's needed, it just needs to be delivered. And if that can be delivered across those three spaces, that could really add up to more than the sum of the parts to, to achieve some of the, the, the change that we need. But there's two other components of this as well, not just increasing ambition, but also increasing coherence and achieving balance as well. So in terms of coherence, we can no longer accept kind of standalone good actions under these separate conventions or good announcements and initiatives from governments and businesses. We really need to see um, a, an end to the, the practices and the decision making and policies and investments that are driving the triple emergency. So all areas of domestic and international policy need to be consistent with those conventions and accompanied by measures that drive real world change. And part of that is by having a balance, a balance of understanding of social and environmental factors on a par with economic decision making. So um, it is the prioritization of economic interests over social and environmental considerations that has led to climate change and environmental decline at a global scale. Um, so this triple emergency is the result of unsustainable development and obviously that urgently needs to be re reversed. So where are we now? So the focus of the G7 and COP26 has very much been on the first of those three priorities on that increasing ambition piece. Um, there's certainly been a ramping up of rhetoric, lots of good speeches, tons of announcements, uh, but does it all add up to what we really need? Um, we have two really important touchstones to, to draw on to address that. The first is the Paris Agreement um, that sets the vision and ambition that countries agreed to, um, to work together towards. And that enshrines limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Um, it calls for um, adaptation to be um, enabled and addressing loss and damage in countries made vulnerable by the triple emergency and a need to mobilize finance to address these challenges. Um, and the other touchstone is the IPCC report on the, the physical science that, that Tom's already mentioned, showing quite clearly the reality that, that we need to address. So COP26 is very much about turning the vision of that Paris Agreement into implementation and responding to the science. Um, and what um, civil society has been kind of working together on and calling for from COP26 are um, six key areas of action. The first, closing the gap um, between what has been pledged so far and the action needed to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. The second area is to address loss and damage that's being suffered right now um, in many, many countries and will only escalate. The third area is to increase climate finance and particularly climate finance for adaptation. Fourth, to scale up high quality nature-based solutions. Uh, fifth, to support a just energy transition. And then finally, to um, act domestically as well on our own um, net zero um, legislation and to actually unlock the green recovery to, to get on track to that domestically. So there's been some progress on some of those areas, but there is still a long way to go until we um, get to Glasgow in just a few weeks time. Uh, COP26 really does provide a focus and opportunity to advance ambition um, and it's a really important moment to push for those high ambition outcomes. Um, but that work needs to continue into next year as well into CBD COP15 to advance ambition on nature outcomes to go alongside that as well. And then alongside those ambition pushes we must continue to push governments and businesses to work on achieving the coherence and the balance across economic, environmental and social challenges and opportunities as well. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak to you all. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion and happy to answer any questions on more details relating to, to COP26 or, or other opportunities. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kat. That was, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, I think that your point about we know what needs to be done, it just needs to happen. It's, it's sort of getting louder and louder and slightly more infuriating because the, the evidence is there, we know what works, it just it needs to be scaled up at this point. And I think that, as you said, te this 10 years is, is the time that, that it has to happen. Well, we'll move on swiftly then. Um, thanks again. So we'll move on now to Dr. Alice Venn, who's uh, from the University of Exeter. He's a lecturer in law um, and has uh, 
has a, a research body that examines the international climate law and policy, and in particular human rights based approaches to climate change, climate loss and damage, and the remedy, remedies available to climate vulnerable states and communities. She's published in both journals and edited collections in the areas of climate law and policy. So Alice, you've got some slides for us, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. And so I'll, I'll try and keep this sort of to a whistle stop tour. Um, basically, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'll be looking at some of the interlinkages between social justice and human rights and how we can start to integrate that into the international approach to climate change moving forward. All right, next slide, please. Uh, and again, thank you. So before I get going, I think it's worth flagging what the linkages are between climate vulnerability and social justice, and what we mean by climate vulnerability. Essentially, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has shed some light on this, and they define vulnerability based on a three-pronged approach. Firstly, that um, a vulnerable system is one that is highly sensitive to modest changes in climate, Secondly, where there is potential for substantial harmful effects. And thirdly, where our ability to adapt is severely constrained. And in the social context, um, there's been a great deal of research um, looking at those social vulnerabilities and existing underlying structural inequalities that may contribute to our vulnerability to climate change. And in particular factors such as our access to resources, uh, poverty, um, marginalization from decision-making processes and institutions, communities that do not have a voice in decision-making are likely to be more vulnerable to climate change impacts and have less support when those climate impacts materialize. And we know that um, particular groups in society are disproportionately affected by climate impacts, in particular, women, young people, older people, persons with disabilities, um, indigenous communities are more likely to be dis disproportionately affected. And that raises fundamental questions of social justice in the climate debate. Next slide, please. So how does that relate to human rights? Well, essentially, we know that climate change has uh, a range of very direct impacts on our enjoyment of fundamental rights, on our right to life, for example, our property rights, our rights to an adequate standard, standard of living, our right to health, and through um, the more obvious impacts such as flooding, heat waves, uh, more intense storm surges, um, and tropical cyclones, all of those things cause very obvious impacts on lives and livelihoods. But also climate change can have an impact on our enjoyment of rights through indirect impacts. Things um, like, for example, exacerbating the risks that already exist around food shortages, water shortages, uh, exacerbating poverty and undermining development efforts. And that's where climate change acts as a so-called threat multiplier. So it, it multiplies existing threats. The World Health Organization has also been doing increasing research around the health impacts of climate change and how those impacts are going to be disproportionately felt by particular groups. Um, and for example, um, has found that groups most likely to experience the increased disease burden as a result of climate change are children, those living in poverty and women, um, which is extremely concerning from a social justice point of view. Next slide, please. Climate change also has a significant effect on human security, and particularly where it's causing mass displacement of communities. And we know that that's happening, particularly with respect to extreme weather events, increasingly frequent um, extreme weather events, such as tropical cyclones um, and sea level rise. And sea level rise is actually threatening the complete inundation of some low-lying island territories. So those countries in the future may need to relocate their entire populations. And that presents um, severe challenges from a social justice point of view. And also, legally speaking, because many of these people do not receive existing protection under the Refugee Convention. 
The International Refugee Convention provides that umbrella protection for individuals seeking to claim asylum in other countries, but it does not recognize uh, displacement as a result of environmental damage or environmental change. Um, it recognizes displacement as a result of political persecution on various grounds, for example, but there is a huge uh, legal gap there which presents serious challenges from the perspective of protecting our fundamental rights as well. And we know that um, people in lower and lower middle income countries are far more likely to be displaced as a result of extreme weather events. So this is a, a matter of global justice as well. And the way that this has been handled um, so far leaves a lot to be desired. Um, there have been instances where individuals have attempted to claim asylum as a result of climate impacts, particularly um, an example here of the Taitiota uh, claim in New Zealand. So this was uh, a Kiribati national trying to claim asylum in New Zealand as a result of climate change impacts, um, water shortages, actually outbreaks of unrest um, and sea level rise um, in his home country. And that claim was repeatedly rejected. Eventually it was brought before the UN Human Rights Committee and the Human Rights Committee, although not recognizing the claim um, to asylum as um, a claim that should have been granted at the time, did leave the door open to future claims in this area where our right to life um, and other key fundamental rights protected under international law are at increasing uh, and immediate risk as a result of climate change impacts, um, such as through water shortages um, and land shortages. So I think this is an area where we're going to see more and more claims coming through and more and more need for proactive uh, legal protection and policy responses as well. Next slide, please. In the climate regime, there's been very, very limited engagement with human rights. The Paris Agreement is the first climate treaty which does acknowledge human rights, but it does so only in the preamble, which is non-binding. So it's framing rights as something which should inform governments' responses to climate change. Governments should take into consideration human rights obligations and particularly the rights of climate vulnerable groups. So there is an acknowledgement that certain groups are disproportionately affected, that they need um, more rights protections being put in place. But it's being framed primarily as safeguarding and policy guidance, as opposed to legally binding rights, which might give rise to some concrete uh, government duties, which from, from a legal perspective is, is quite problematic. Next slide, please. The UN human rights bodies are also engaging with this from the other side. So they know that climate change is presenting a huge threat to a wide range of human rights right across the board from civil and political rights through to socioeconomic rights. And that's being acknowledged by the UN Human Rights Council in a series of resolutions. Most recently, um, just this month, the Human Rights Council recognized the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a key right that's also important for the enjoyment of other human rights, which was a really important step forward. But again, this is non-binding. This doesn't um, have footing in a, in a treaty. And it remains to be seen whether national governments are going to increasingly adopt this. Um, although it is worth flagging that um, there are uh, examples of best practice around the world where governments have um, included this, for example, in their constitutions or in bills of rights. There is some movement in that direction, which is really encouraging. And um, the prioritization of the needs of particularly climate vulnerable groups needs to be taken into consideration in that process. Next slide, please. I'm also very interested in procedural climate justice. And what I mean by that is the rights of particularly climate vulnerable groups, um, but also groups who are going to be disproportionately affected by the transition to a low carbon future itself, having a voice in that decision-making process um, and having procedural rights, for example, access to information on climate change, which is accessible and relevant um, to a range of different sectors and, and different policy measures. And being able to participate in decision-making um, directly, ideally through uh, local government, but also at the national level. 
and having recourse to some complaints mechanisms and being able to hold those decision makers to account where they fail to take into consideration the needs of those groups. And we actually conducted a recent case study looking at Bristol as a city which has adopted really, really ambitious climate targets um, with a net zero uh, target by 2030 um, and aiming to become fully climate resilient by 2030, as well as a commitment to a just transition, which is really unique. But we sort of wanted to break that down and say, well, what does just transition mean? Who's participating in that process? Uh, so Dr. Alex Dietzel from the University of Bristol and I looked at decision making from six, um, we call them sub-state climate stakeholders. So um, stakeholders from the public, private and civil society sectors, conducted some interviews, observed meetings and decision making that was going on. And we found that although just transition was being widely engaged with, it was something that organisations and stakeholders were keen to engage with. The way that that was being interpreted and implemented varied widely. There was no accepted definition or um, accepted steps, if you like, about how to start to implement that. There needed to be a lot more ownership of the targets as well, breaking down those targets, making it clear who's responsible for implementing them and setting some clear interim steps towards these really ambitious overarching targets. And crucially, there was also very much um, sort of a, a huge problem really with um, securing sufficient diversity and gender balance in the decision making processes themselves. Um, and we looked at, for example, the number of times um, that participants spoke in meetings, who was dominating those meetings. Um, and sadly, that's reinforced um, some of the problems that we're seeing at the global level um, with sadly white men dominating the discussion and there not being sufficient participation for, for other groups in those decision making processes. So we recommended that much wider public consultation and also accountability mechanisms needed to be built into that process moving forward and particularly prioritise the needs of climate vulnerable groups and groups likely to be negatively affected by the transition um, to a low carbon future by some of those measures to mitigate climate change. Next slide, please. So just to briefly touch on some of the things we need to change, we'd like to see um, much more um, in terms of the embedding of human rights and the rights of vulnerable groups into the global response to climate change. This is something that has been historically neglected and there needs to be a lot more targeted funding and capacity building for that purpose with human rights bodies and climate bodies working together and making sure that those groups have some sort of procedural climate justice as well, that they are able to participate in decision making, both at the national level through national government policy, um, but ideally also at the international level. And this is something that has been severely lacking um, with certain states dominating the global discourse and there not being much room for other voices, um, for civil society groups, community groups, um, and representatives of climate vulnerable uh, groups from society. And governments need to be held accountable as well. Um, there needs to be some um, accountability mechanisms, particularly at the national level, um, through, for example, public forums, things like citizens' assemblies, um, complaints mechanisms before the courts, making things like judicial review more available. Um, and civil society has a really important role to play in that process in holding governments accountable to increasing ambition. Thank you. I think I'll leave it there um, and welcome any questions you have. Great. Thanks very much, Alice. We'll go on to questions later, obviously. Um, but that was fascinating. Um, yeah, I think there's certainly a feeling from a lot of this that we don't have the tools in place yet. And I think that's what was felt. 70 years ago with the Geneva Convention is that the new normal needs different tools. And I think that's probably where we are now. Um, we're a little bit behind time, so hopefully we'll get through all the speakers. And if you are willing to stay a little longer than the build time, we will stay on and do question and answer afterwards. Next on our list, we've got uh, John Mungai, who's um, calling us. I think he's not gonna be able to call us with video, so we'll, we'll hear his voice um, from, from East Africa. John's the East African coordinator for the Weather and Climate Information Services 
of Africa, which is easily pronounced as WISER program. John is a meteorologist by profession, having graduated from the University of Nairobi um, and has worked in institutions such as the Kenya Meteorological Department as a weather and climate forecaster. So WISER is really what he's working on right now to enhance the resilience of people accessing weather and climate information services in East Africa. John, if your connection still works, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to share with you uh, what we've been doing here in East Africa for the last five years or so as a uh, WISER program. I was very fascinated to listen to Alice then. Um, I thought she was speaking to my heart when she was talking about climate justice. And these are some of the reasons why FCDO got involved in this region of ours to see what they can do to help the situation. As she said, uh, Africa is one of the, is disproportionately affected by climate change uh, compared with, with other regions actually. And some of the reasons include the, the issue of being very highly vulnerable to variations and you know climate change. And these have resulted in extreme events um, such as the flooding and droughts, heat waves, landslides. And uh, this, these events really have, uh, in some instances, been able to uh, push back development in my region. I have seen uh, droughts uh, which have become more frequent, uh, making people really poor, people who are doing very well, and then all their cattle die and so forth, and then they become very poor. I have seen uh, flooding incidents where roads and bridges and so forth have been swept overnight and uh, to make those roads again takes too long. So this again pushes people back and so on and so forth. So we have low adaptive capacity and uh, climate information services is not really being used. Uh, there is minimal use of climate information services. So these are some of the reasons why FCBO felt it needed to intervene and see what it could do. And WISA then was, 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 was formed. WISA stands for Weather and Climate Information Services for Africa. And it seeks to address some of the barriers to the uptake and use of climate information services. And some of these barriers, because we scoped and so on, we've found that there are issues to do with governance, uh, you know, the national med service level, uh, issues to do with research. Uh, it's a barrier again to uptake and use of climate information services. We have issues of capacity at human level, technical, infrastructural. All these are barriers to the uptake and use of climate information services. So the aim of WISA was actually to bring about a transformational change in the availability, access, and use of climate information, information services. And in order to be able to do this, we, we supported, uh, or we have supported from, from about 2015, um, the whole of the inf uh, climate information value chain, right from the producer level at the national medical services level, through the intermediaries who are in between, and then also the users, because the users need to be able to understand what the producer is giving them as a focus, for example. And we have done this through uh, various, various methods, uh, one of which is co-production. Co-production has been key to stimulate the use of climate information services for users to understand what is being given and for the producers to understand what the user actually needs and also to support the people in between to be able to provide uh, these issues. So we were able to design a program um, because we realized that uh, some of the interventions needed to be regional, some of the interventions in the climate information value chain needed to be national, and some needed to be at community level. So we have a healthy mix of regional, national, and community level projects. And we had, or we've been having about 16 projects um, in that period of time, addressing particular areas of intervention. I I'm sure I don't have a lot of time to go into that, but just to highlight a few of them. For example, there's one we were calling Highway. Highway is High Impact Lake System. This is a project which was implemented uh, in, uh, on Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is shared by Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, and to a small extent also Rwanda. Now this is a this is a lake which is used by many many fishermen, especially, and uh, we used to lose uh, many lives, uh, upwards of three thousand people per annum, and some of the reasons, not all of them, 
were weather related. And so we were able to put in place an early warning service for this lake, which is used by fishermen in line with their needs because we had to sit down with them. So this, this was a regional, an example of a regional project which we undertook among those four countries. Uh, an example of a community project is what we call Daraja, which is a project which looked at people who live in informal settlements of Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. And these are people who are really very poor. And we didn't know whether they would require weather and climate information because they have many other problems. But we were surprised that we were really quite interested in, in weather and climate. And whenever we would give a, a forecast, for example, in these areas, they would know when to go and unclog the drains and so forth. So we had reduced incidents of flooding in, 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 some, in some, of these, some of these areas. So each of the countries which were involved here in, the, in, in this program also had a national project in line with their requirements. For example, in Kenya, we came in at a time when they were decentralizing, decentralizing services uh, from the headquarters to the regions. And so we were able to do to be able to help the Kenya Med Department to decentralize and to equip the directors of, of weather in those regions with ideas on how they could then mainstream uh, weather forecasts at the regional at the at the regional level or at the county level and so forth. And you also know that we have some fairly fragile countries in our region, for example, Somalia, South Sudan, and uh, they, they lack institutions and so forth. And so we went in and, and, and were able to help them, for example, start their own national climate outlook forums and things of that nature. So each country has got had a program or a project uh, in line with the requirements. For example, in Uganda, we had uh, to translate forecasts into 22 local languages because we found out that the forecast was being provided in English and so forth, but people were not understanding this language, so we had to translate to local languages and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of things that we've been doing in the last uh, five years or so. We're about closing the program, uh, but uh, there are some preliminary insights of uh, what we have achieved, and uh, studies have shown that, to, that now uh, we have about three million households that are receiving weather and climate information due to our in intervention. And out of that, about 500,000 households are actually using improved weather and climate information services across all the, all the projects. And this is really doing uh, wonders in terms of resilience. And uh, we are targeting that by the end of, by the time that we you know, put all the data together, we shall have improved the resilience of about 14 million individuals in East Africa, and perhaps have an accrued social economic benefit of about 100, 190 million uh, pounds. So these are the things which uh, we have done uh, in, in a nutshell. But at the end of the program, we had, uh, we had a learning event. We had a learning event, and in this learning event, we had uh, four policy briefs which uh, which came out and uh, which can, uh, can also be shared uh, widely with people if they're interested. And one of the issues, which one of the things which you have seen out of this learning program is that uh, the issue of gender is key. Uh, because if you, want, uh, if you want people to really uptake uh, and use climate information services, you also have to involve, uh, you have to involve our women folk in decision making, and that, and I think that is one of the points which was made by by Alice as procedural, you know, climate justice. You really need to do that. So you also have some recommendations uh, regarding co-production, uh, which is key if you want people to use the services, and for that service to then enhance their 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 resilience. Also, if you want to to improve or to sustain the services, uh, then one has to really talk to the national med services and to build their capacity, not just in the technical areas, but you know, holistic sort of capacity building so that they can be able to also even get funding from, from, from other, other sources uh, and so on and so forth. So some of these uh, learnings can, we can avail uh, some of the areas, I mean, the, the, the websites where you can go and uh, read more about these areas. We also have a policy brief on people who want to, to work in Africa in this area, 
And we are recommending that you don't just support, for example, the National Med Service. You have to support the National Med Service, the intermediaries, and also the users. And that is when you support the whole value chain, then you start to see to see some of the results uh, fairly uh, fast. Um, I'm going to stop there uh, for now. And uh, I want to thank you very much for the kind invitation. Great. Thanks, John. That was really fascinating. And if you can share any of those papers on the chat or or with Sweden, I'm sure there's ways that we can we can share that more broadly. Uh, but it's great to hear a you know really tangible, practical solution that's making such a huge impact. So uh, our final speaker for the day uh, is Anushri Rao from Concern Worldwide. Anushri is the director of policy and campaigns at Concern, um, and she leads a team to influence decision makers and hold them to account to the actions they need to take to end extreme poverty uh, for people living in some of the world's most fragile and climate affected countries. Anushri is experienced on leading on policy and advocacy initiatives for development organizations and leading civil society coalitions for a collaborative approach to advocacy and influencing. So please Anushri, take the floor. Thank you so much. Um, and it's been a real pleasure just hearing everyone else speak as well. Um, so it's, um, for those of you less familiar with Concern, we are an international development and humanitarian organization uh, with a mission to end extreme poverty. We've been working for over 50 years with some of the poorest and most vulnerable communities in some of the most extreme and fragile contexts. Um, and our work ranges from providing rapid emergency response to supporting long-term resilience through health, nutrition, livelihood support, um, such initiatives, and enabling essentially communities to be better prepared for, respond to, and recover from shocks. Um, now, without doubt, the key challenges that we are facing in the countries we operate in are um, hunger and malnutrition, climate change, and conflict. And what makes it worse is that they all overlap in this really complex and challenging nexus that is pushing communities deeper and deeper into really inextricable poverty. Um, and from a climate standpoint, on one hand, we are looking at infrequent and unpredictable rains that are impacting the kind of food quantity and quality grown. And on the other hand, we're looking at untimely rains and floods that are resulting in large scale crop failure, while rising temperatures are also causing like all sorts of pests to multiply and further damage crops and food output. Climate change is also reducing the availability of natural resources, especially water, which is then further impacting food uh, production for some of the really poor farmers uh, and pastoralists that we work with. Um, now, the Global hun Hunger Index, which is one of the flagship reports that Concern works in partnership with, um, shows that climate change has had indirect as well as direct uh, negative impacts on food security and hunger. Uh, through changes in food production and availability, access, quality, uh, consumption, as well as the wider like stability of food systems. Um, food production and nutrition quality is declining in response to um, the higher and higher temperatures that we are seeing. Uh, water scarcity is widespread. Um, and then with the greater uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the um, atmosphere, we are seeing a reduction in the nutritional quality, especially the impact on like protein, zinc, and iron content of crops. Um, to add to this, more frequent extreme events such as heat waves, droughts, and floods are causing um, you know crops to be destroyed, um, to have like zero harvest, and so on. Um, and so we can see that um, on one hand we've got the impact on production, and then uh, the food shortages result in food price hikes. There's also income losses. And so people are generally, you know, having a really reduced access to food and consumption. Um, in 2020, close to 12% of the global population was severely food insecure, which was around 928 million. Um, this was one uh, over uh, nearly 150 million more than uh, in 2019. And of course, the pandemic has really complicated and further exacerbated global hunger. Um, it's a real shame that we've, you know, 149 million children are also stunted, which is that they're too short for their age, suffering variable degrees of physical and mental, um, you know, um, stunting in, in the sense of disabilities. 
and 45 million children are wasted, which is what they're so dangerously thin that they're almost on the brink of, um, you know, survival. And the pandemic has exacerbated this global hunger and malnutrition, but worsening climate change and protracted crisis uh, conflict are among the key drivers uh, for the reversal on the downward trend in global hunger. Then the global report on food crisis this year showed that uh, at least 105 mil uh, 55 million people in around 55 countries or territories were in crisis or worse levels of hunger, uh, which is an increase of roughly 20 million from 2019. And of these 133,000 people were in the most severe phase, which is IPC levels five, um, which is catastrophic hunger where widespread death and total loss of livelihoods arrive. And of course, most like a number of these crises are fueled by conflict, but a changing climate is definitely contributing to the inability of people to grow, harvest, consume, and store food. I'm sure you've read about Madagascar, which has suffered around four years of little or no rain, resulting in it being on the brink of a climate-induced famine. Um, and we're all familiar with the El Nino weather event of 2015-2016, which was exacerbated by higher sea surface temperatures and led to widespread food insecurity and hunger in multiple countries. Now, in, since the 1990s, we're seeing the number of extreme weather-related disasters doubling, which is affecting the productivity of major crops and causing food price hikes and income losses. Um, and we know that under scenarios of um, where global warming remains below two degrees, uh, climate change adaptation costs can be uh, expected to go up to $300 billion uh, per year by 2030 um, and rise to around $500 billion by 2050. Um, you know, if, if we have global warming, uh, warming scenarios where temperature rises further, these figures will obviously be greater. Uh, and I know uh, Alice mentioned that climate change is both a, um, a poverty and a vulnerability multiplier. We are definitely seeing this in the countries we are working with. It's disproportionately hitting hardest the people who are least responsible for causing it. Um, these people you know, are facing the most severe climate impacts. They have the least capacity to adapt and find it hardest to recover from the loss and damage caused by devastating floods, droughts, heat waves, cyclones, and rising sea levels on a recurrent basis. Um, and concern, the way concern works is that we're obviously responding to emergencies and disasters. We responded to around 78 different emergencies in 23 countries last year. Uh, but on the longer term, we, we work on programs that build better adaptation capacity and resilience amongst communities. Um, these include provision of livelihood support and social protection uh, through initiatives such as cash transfers, uh, malnutrition prevention, but also treatment through ready-to-use therapeutic foods for children most at risk, um, climate smart ag agriculture and resource conservation, early warning and early action so that you know we can have fewer fewer people going um having the inability to cope with disasters as and when they strike and scaling up approaches such as uh, the community management of acute malnutrition or cmam surge which is an innovative health systems approach um, to help prepare health facilities in a way that they can respond to increased demands in uh, acute malnutrition treatment that happens seasonally or due to unforeseen shocks and stresses. Just to get you a, give you a little idea of the kind of programs we work on, in Malawi, we um, have the PROSPER, the Promoting Sustainable Partnerships for Empowered Resilience. This was a multi-stakeholder resilience building program uh, supporting the government to reduce extreme poverty uh, with funding from UK, uh, the UK government under its flagship uh, BRAC program, which is building resilience and adaptation to climate, uh, climate change, sorry, um, over a four year, uh, roughly four year uh, period. The program intended to reach over 1 million vulnerable people in four uh, districts and was jointly implemented in two consortiums, one led by uh, Concern and one was an, uh, a UN-based consortium. And the activity specifically focused on training and supporting farmers on climate smart agriculture practices so that they could increase crop yields while conserving natural resources. Um, farmers were 
able to make positive choices about their farming practices, crop diversification, planting early maturing and drought, uh, drought resilient uh, crop varieties, mixed cropping, using compost manure, constructing water harvesting structures, and practicing wider conservation agriculture. We have seen better results um, in terms of the quality of produce and yields and improved farming and water harvesting practices. Um, I said was, however, because unfortunately this year in May, with no prior indication, the UK government or FCDO communicated an early termination of funding to this uh, to the NGO-led consortium that Concern was leading on the program. Um, which has resulted, uh, impacted a number of the poorest and most vulnerable communities we work in. Um, in Somalia, we work on the Somali Cash uh, Consortium, which benefits uh, over 30,000 beneficiaries through mobile cash transfers, so a means of social protection, uh, helping them uh, cope with drought and insecurity. We worked with farmers in Somaliland on training and agriculture inputs for climate smart and soil rehabilitation farming techniques. We work with women and self-help groups to uh, help set up small business trainings and provide startup grants. Um, and we also work on wider disaster management plans, uh, plans including early warning mechanisms and early response. Um, in Kenya, we've been working on um, supporting some of the most vulnerable communities cope with drought-like conditions because uh, we've seen that you know water sources have dried up and failed crops are common in many parts of uh, the communities that we are working with. So we are helping uh, communities respond to these um, to uh, this really difficult uh, time and also supporting children who are at risk of uh, death from starvation. And lastly, we are obviously uh, looking at advocacy towards decision makers, including the UK government, on raising their investment. We're calling for um, increased financing. As uh, Kat mentioned, um, in 2009, wealthy countries committed to mobilize 100 billion in annual climate finance to assist low-income countries to address climate change. Not only has this target not been met, but there are chronic financing gaps that exist. Um, we worked with uh, our partners under the Zurich uh, Flood Resilience Alliance in the, out, uh, the At What Cost report, which shows that investments for climate change adaptation are not going to people living in extreme poverty and has no correlation with the climate vulnerability of a given country, which means in short that funds are not being targeted based on need. What we really need is an urgent scale up in climate finance that is targeting the most fragile countries and the people greatest in need. Um, now, the UK government had a commitment to invest 50% of UK aid to the most fragile and conflict affected states. Now, as it reviews its international development strategy, a focus for us is to ensure that you know, this commitment is upheld because it is at risk and that the most vulnerable and marginalized communities such as women and children are prioritized. We also want this funding to be flexible so that it can be invested in uh, preparedness and resilience building, but at the same time there should be flexibility mechanisms built in which enable <laughs> anticipatory action and early response to floods, droughts and other shocks as soon as they set in. Um, and lastly, something that we're calling for is locally led adaptation. We know that the communities um, we work with understand the challenges and play an important role in the solutions. They are inherently resilient, but the growing frequency and severity of climate shocks is really weakening their coping mechanisms beyond measure. We want decision makers to scale up and champion locally led adaptation that strengthens the decision making power of affected people, especially the marginalized groups, as has been mentioned, women, children, people with disabilities, indigenous peoples, etc. Um, lastly, I'd like to say climate, like to tackle climate change, the other aspect of it is also financing for hunger and nutrition. Uh, nutrition for um, the funding for nutrition was disproportionately cut by around 70% as part of the wider aid cuts. This year being the nutrition for um, nutrition year for action and the nutrition for growth summit in December, we would like to see uh, a commitment to investment in tackling uh, the growing hunger and malnutrition. Um, and we're also working with 
CAT and CAN UK and other sector colleagues to ensure that at COP some of the commitments to finance are upheld. Um, to end by strengthening the resilience of people to withstand current and projected weather and climate related shocks and stresses, we want to halt the cycle of humanitarian crisis that is affecting people's lives and harms our poverty reduction efforts. Um, in the absence of this, and with further worsening of climate change and hunger, we are sure to face a humanitarian crisis which would be unsurmountable for us to tackle, um, while at the same time, development efforts will continue becoming more challenging and effective uh, and expensive, sorry. And I'll stop at that. Thank you, Thank Tom. You. Thanks a lot, Anushri. That was really fascinating. There's a lot, a lot to take in. I think for everybody, that uh, you know, we're not going to solve the triple emergency in one hour. Um, certainly not in 45 minutes. Um, we have, you know, grossly overrun already. Um, and there was a few questions that came in. I'm not going to be able to go through them all, unfortunately. But one of them I thought was quite interesting, which was, you know, a lot of organisations, uh, small, small incomes, and, and 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 don't necessarily feel that they can lead in this sort of stuff. And one of the questions that came in that maybe maybe Kat from from can can can, can answer is what can small organisations do to be more involved in advocacy around climate crisis? Kat. Great, thanks so much. So um, yeah, you can get involved in in Can UK or in in Bond joint activities. We really do appreciate that. Um, yeah, not all organisations can can meet every priority or to to have um, all the kind of in house expertise on the different issues. But we certainly um, try and and pool the kind of resources that exist and the expertise that exists in the sector and do kind of sign on letters and sign on statements together. So really, really. Um, keen to have as many organizations in, involved with that if you if you are, are interested in this topic and would like to support some of those activities um please do get in touch and i think you know it, it's always a challenge to think how to integrate this in, into our work but i think um you know one of the things that we can all do is try and think about some of those kind of interlinkages or unintended consequences or kind of longer term um impacts in, in some of our our work and really kind of what what are the changes that need to come about this this decade in kind of how we do things as much as what we do as well? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think the key is, you know, we're going to have to do this together. And whether you're a big organisation or a small organisation, you've got something to bring to that party. And I think, you know, this is why Sweden is doing something like this. And I think if people, you know, aren't members already of Sweden, it's a great way into that space to have those conversations. But as is Can UK Bond as well. I mean. It's all about how do you create those platforms to, to join join together and, and share joint knowledge and, and sh shared vision. So um, I don't have uh, any more time for any more questions. I am a terrible timekeeper, um, but I just want to check. We've got a list here of everything else that's going on. And I think people got quite excited by um, some of the advocacy discussions. So there's, there's certainly some more discussions around advocacy and justice at 10 to 10.45 on Thursday. So uh, but there's, you know, everything on there should be exciting and interesting. So please sign up if you haven't already. Um, and other than that, just a huge thank you to, to my four speakers. Really, really appreciated um, what you did. There's a poll up that Hannah's just put up to see how you felt about this session. Um, hopefully timekeeping is not one of the questions on there. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for, for taking part and, and hope to see you later in the week. Thanks, Tom. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.